Sometimes the best stories in golf aren't found on tour. You'll find them at the back of the range. And here's your host, Ben Adelberg. Thank you again for joining me here at the back of the range. I am your host, Ben Adelberg, and this is episode 22. That voice you just heard is our good friend, Mitch Phillips. He kicks off the show each and every week and makes us sound much better than we really are. Do you want to learn more about Mitch Phillips? He's a pretty big deal. Check him out at mpvoice.com. So it's a short week for us here at the back of the range. We're going to get out of town for a few days, take a little golf vacation. It's a little bit of a working vacation. I'll be bringing the podcast gear along with me to record an episode or two. I tell you where we're off to, but um, you know what? Hold on. Mitch. Everything just sounds better when Mitch says it. So, uh, Mitch, tell our listeners where we're going this weekend. Later this month, the Back of the Range podcast and a few lucky listeners head north of the border for a bucket list golf adventure of a lifetime. For our loyal followers on social media, we will post behind-the-scenes photos and videos of our journey from beginning to end, conversations with caddies, views of the golf courses, and all the local flavor of Inverness, Nova Scotia. Finally, we will sit down for our very first on-site interview for the Back of the Range. Joining us will be the facility's general manager, Andrew Alkenbrack. We will discuss the facility's two golf courses, the links, and the cliffs. And to get the full story of how these two courses have found themselves ranked in the world's top 100 courses less than 10 years after they were built, stay tuned to Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The Back of the Range podcast heads to Cabot. What a trip we have in store coming this weekend. Cannot wait to get up to Cabot in Nova Scotia. While I'm there, I'm going to see if I can pick up some souvenirs to give away to some of the listeners. So, here's what I want you to do. Shoot me an email, ben at thebackoftherange.com. Let me know what you want out of the pro shop. Now, no guarantees, but let me know what you'd like, and if I can do it, I'll pick up something for you and I'll send it to a few of the listeners. Like Mitch said, we're going to be providing updates the entire time, so make sure that you're following on Instagram. Check us out, the Back of the Range podcast. We'll be on Facebook and Twitter as well. And don't forget, the central hub of the podcast is thebackoftherange.com. That's where you can find all of our previous episodes. Before we hit the road to Cabot, we have a very special episode that we've been promoting for quite some time. I wasn't going to leave town without posting it for you today. This week's guest, Steve Burkowski from the Golf Channel. He's been with the Golf Channel for nearly 20 years. He's their resident college golf insider. And as of right now, he's at Stillwater, Oklahoma. First, the ladies' national championship, then the men. He's there the entire time providing wall-to-wall coverage. You'll see Steve in action from beginning to end. Steve also serves as an interviewer and reporter at PGA Tour and Web.com Tour events. He's a studio host for the Golf Channel's European Tour coverage, and he shows up on Golf Central from time to time. On a personal note, Man, I can't really thank Steve enough for his time and support of this podcast. He not only shared his time to record his episode, but he's been providing me with invaluable feedback and advice along the way. To be able to bounce ideas off one of the best guys in the business, well, I'm incredibly fortunate. So without further delay, I'm thrilled to welcome Steve Burkowski to the Back of the Range Golf Podcast. Burko, how you doing, sir? I am doing great, my friend. Happy to be joining you tonight. I appreciate it. Well, we are. Uh, we're, you just mentioned before we start going, you're you're anxiously uh, awaiting the the draft pick of a certain football team. We're doing this on the Thursday NFL draft night. Which team are you looking at? Uh, before we get into uh, all things golf, which team are you looking at, and why? And uh, are you going to be okay when you, when they uh, make their pick? Well, I am a diehard New York Jets fan, being born in New York City, growing up. Uh, in New Jersey, um, my uncle was the defensive coordinator for the Jets back in the day, so I grew up going to training camp, getting to hang out with Richard Todd and Mark Gastineau and Joe Klecko and all those stars from the 70s and 80s. So my roots run very deep to the Northeast in the New York Jets, and we're now coming on close to 50 years since that Super Bowl three victory when Joe Willie Namath led them uh, – to the promised land over the Colts. So I fully expect the Jets to pick the wrong person. I don't know who the right one is with all these quarterbacks, but for 
every opportunity when you could have had Dan Marino and got Ken O'Brien, Ken O'Brien. or you took Jeff Lagerman, or you took Blair Thomas. The, the litany of poor first round selections have gone on for decades with the Jets. So maybe they'll surprise me, but uh, yes, I will. I will live to see another day. Let's just hope <laughs> even the more diehard Jet fans uh, will survive this one. I think the only saving grace they have. You know, this draft used to be in New York for decades, been there, traveling it around, and it's in Dallas. Think about this one in New York City tonight. The Giants picking second, the Jets picking third. Um, Maybe it's a good thing that they're about 1,200 miles away because all heck might break loose. Yeah, there would have been a riot. The diehard fans, uh, if they went the wrong way. Yeah, there would have been a riot. Wow, Uh, it sounds like you're a a disgruntled football uh, announcer that that got stuck in golf, but we know that's not the case. But (laughs) but, uh, your primary responsibility is golf right now, so you are the quote-unquote resident college golf insider for the Golf Channel. I know you do just a a truckload of things for them as everyone knows just that follows the golf channel can you recap just your current responsibilities at the golf channel well you know you hit it on the head with regards to being a college golf insider and expert when i started uh, back in orlando golf channel headquarters back in 2000 that was sort of the niche i created to to establish myself through the nearly two decades now ben It has allowed me to create relationships and build up a resume of knowledge, information, getting better at what I'm doing. And now as the play-by-play host for the web.com tour, reporting, doing interviews, uh, did play-by-play for the early coverage of the PGA Tour in Houston a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've been fortunate. I've been very lucky. And it really all stems from this college angle that I uh, quite honestly created uh, 17, 18 years ago. So to be the college insider at this time of the year with NCAAs just around the corner in Stillwater, Oklahoma, to the web.com tour, to the PGA tour, to hosting Golf Central, uh, I've been fortunate and blessed to chase my dream and, um, you know, see where it's come 20 years uh, since graduating college. Was this something that someone came to you and said, hey, we'd like you to kind of cultivate this knowledge? Or did you take it upon yourself to throw that idea in your head? What kind of sparked the interest of, you know, because this is not, you know, this is back, I mean, you're saying 16, 17 years ago, so early 2000. How did you get started into learning more about college golf? Well, you know, I'm going to go back even a few years earlier. Graduated uh, from the University of Florida in December of 94 and uh, always wanted to be a sportscaster. Knew that from the age of 12 back in the uh, early to mid 80s. But of course, the Golf Channel wasn't around then. But as we just had our little dialogue with the NFL, I'm a sports nut, a sports junkie. I was the kid that had the radio under his sheets at 10 o'clock at night to listen to Georgetown St. John's while your parents thought you were sleeping. So I've always been inundated and all-encompassing regarding sports. Absolutely love it. Had an interview with the Golf Channel right when they started. I don't even know if they were on the air yet. Uh, Buddy Alexander, the head coach at Florida, um, helped me with some connections, got in the door, and quite honestly, they didn't know what was going to happen. They were hopeful they would be successful. Long story short, Keep in touch. We're going to see if we can get this thing off the ground. And it was the best decision going against me I ever had when I look at it in hindsight. I was 22 years old, would have no business being on television at that point. Um, you know, it was that ambitious, uh, overzealous kid that thought I could do it all. Go to Columbia, South Carolina, do radio for four and a half years. Talk radio was starting to become popular back then. I was the voice of the Lady Gamecocks basketball team a tremendous amount of responsibilities at that age, but it was the perfect way to cut my teeth. So for four and a half years, I wrote 10 letters to five different people. Twice a year, those five people got letters from me. It took four and a half years to finally get a call. And I got into the golf channel, hired as a PA, as low as you can start, took a pay cut, not that I was making a lot of money doing radio in sure. South Carolina, okay. but I wanted to be at the Golf Channel. If I had a dollar for everybody that told me you will never be on air, you can leave that at the door, and I simply would not accept that. Scott Van Pelt, many people don't maybe remember, he started at the Golf Channel Absolutely. in the production aspect. 
Kelly Tillman also worked in the library and made it on air. So I was, I guess, the third person to ever do that. But I realized quickly this was not going to be easy. People just said, we don't do that. I said, well, yes, you do. You've done it before, so it can happen. And at this point, Golf Channel's five, six years in existence. I remember vividly someone saying, we've got to do a preview for the 2000 NCAA championships. I've been there a few months. I, I said, I got it. I'm doing it. I go to the library. We have no video. We have nothing. We have Matt Kuchar at Augusta or at the Olympic Club when he played in those majors as an amateur. We have nothing from Luke Donald. So I turned that into an opportunity to say, we need B-roll. We need some video, something from these guys if we're going to do it. So I'd go out, get the basics, and then I'd go do a story on my own and bring it back. And then I'd go back out and convince them I needed to go on another trip. And I would voice these stories for me. They would not allow me on air. Eventually, after a year or two of this, we realized there's something here. There are some very talented young teenage, early 20s men and women that are now becoming successful in professional golf. And I did a mock tape with Jennifer Mills, one of our original hosts sure. in Columbus, Ohio, in 2002. And she sort of threw me a curveball. She asked me, what do I want to do? I said, exactly what you're doing. And she said, show up tomorrow. We'll do a mock tape. And she asked me, what do you want me to ask you? I said, I'm not sure what you mean. She's like, well, let me know where you want to go and I'll get you there. I said, you take me anywhere you want to go. I'll have the answers. And we did this mock tape, put it on the desk of my boss, who ultimately took it to the president of the Golf Channel. I got eight letters from four men's and women's coaches supporting the idea of this guy knows what's going on. We love what you're trying to do with college golf. We would love to see more. And if you do it, he needs to be the guy. As I like to interpret the story, as I heard it up and down the food chain, it went to David Manugian, who was the president of the Golf Channel at the time. And he looked at the tape, said, no, pretty good, not bad. You know, rough around the edges, but understands what it's about. Sure. And he said, where are these letters coming from? Did they just send them unsolicitedly? And they said, no. You know, Burkowski said, would you be willing to write letters on my behalf? And again, how I like to interpret how the story trickled down, he sort of looked up, said, that takes balls. Give him a chance. And lo and behold, we created a college show, uh, College Central, presented by Ping, that ran for about four years. So by the time I was 30, I finally wore him down, created my niche, did something that no one else was doing or was as knowledgeable about the content. And 15 years later, I, as I say, I continue to fool him. I'm still on air. And uh, <laughs> I know that's a long-winded answer, no. but – the, the, the story to get to that point, uh, I felt needed a little explanation and, and, you know, some background on that. But it was not given to me. And I just don't know how it all fell into place. But I knew I had to do something that was going to stand out. I had to take risks. I wasn't married at the time. I didn't have kids. What do you have to lose? And ultimately, it allowed me to be doing what I've been doing for the past 18 years at Golf Channel. That's a great story because it really has a great corollary and relationship with the actual game of golf. Golf is, you know, people can tell you you're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to turn pro. You're not going to be able to make this scholarship. You're not going to make this team. But if you put the work in and you just, you know, dig into it as hard as you can, you will see the results and you just stuck around and, and fought for it and, and you got it. So, you know, kudos to you. And yeah, it just has a great relationship with the game of golf itself. You no, know, I appreciate it. And it's funny, I'll get asked a lot by young up and coming reporters, journalists, whether from the University of Florida or on my PGA tour stops. And they'll ask me, how do I get there? Can you take a look at my reel? And I'm very happy to help and share any advice because let's be honest, whatever profession you enter, you need some luck, you need timing, you need to know the right people. And I'll give them my ideas, my input, but I said there's no secret sauce. Yeah. You roll up your sleeves, you dig in, you show up early, you leave late, you volunteer for everything under the sun, and you get good at what you want to do. Find something you want to do, 
and get good at it. You know, it seems easy. This generation these days, uh, you know, <laughs> well, it, it, it's yeah. just a little different than the way you and I grew up. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're, you're a hundred percent right. And there is a, like you said, there's no substitute for hard work and a little bit of luck. Um, all right. So let's, let's transition a little bit into your current responsibilities, things you see, things that you do. You're always around the PGA tour, um, you know, web.com, you're around these players and you know, if there's the image that the golfing viewing public sees of you or other golf channel, uh, on air talent, I guess one of my first questions to you is after rounds of golf, you have the, you know, typical interview with the, with the pro that just shot 68, 70, 74, whatever he shot. And you hear the same kind of questions like, you know, what was the key to your success today? And what are you going to need to do tomorrow to win? Sometimes these post round interviews come off as extremely scripted. How much work goes into preparing for these post round interviews with these stars of the PGA tour? A ton. Um, to be honest, it's not the most difficult thing I do, but I believe it might be the most challenging because if I'm doing interviews on a Thursday, Friday at a PGA tour event, you might interview upwards of four five, six, seven players. And you're trying to basically ask the same thing in four five, six, seven different ways. We all fall into ruts. I'll be the first one to raise my hand of, Gosh, as soon as I'm done, I, I can't believe I went there. It's such a fine line, Ben, because you want to go into an interview with a plan, yet have the ability to hit the brakes, do a complete 180, and go somewhere else if the person you're interviewing takes you there. Sure. It's a little bit of an art to have something in your mind, ask a question, listen to the answer, react to the answer, all while hearing the producer in the truck telling you to hurry up one more. We're going to 12. I don't know how I've learned to separate the two in my mind. At least I think I do it fairly well. Um, Certain players, you know, you can just go with it and they're going to take you places. Others, I think you have to have a somewhat scripted scenario in your head, but again, never getting locked into it. But certainly one of the biggest challenges I face and look forward to when I go to a PGA tour event and then sometimes in the weekend, you'll see our pre rounders before they're going to tee off in that final twosome might even be more challenging because let's bring up, we'll say Ricky Fowler. He has had struggles on Sunday, closing it out. Sure. That's what everybody wants to know about, or at least, you know, react or respond to. I can't go there. In my opinion, this guy is about to tee off, whether it's Ricky or anybody else, to win for the first time, the fifth time, the hundredth time. You have to keep it somewhat in a positive frame because that's where I believe the respect for the player. Okay. You can't put something into somebody's mind 40 minutes before they're going to the first tee of, oh, geez, Burko's right. I haven't closed one of these things in six years. How am I going to do it today? So... One of the keys I try to use in a post-rounder, a pre-rounder, are the player's words from earlier that week, earlier that month, maybe a year ago, of, hey, we had a conversation two days ago or last month, and you told me this. Tiger Woods, perfect example. I got to interview him Friday at Honda. He's making the comeback. He's finally playing some golf. And one of the questions I asked was a reference from his press conference two days earlier of, he said, give me time. Everybody's trying to go from zero to 60 here. I'm just slowly creeping back and trying to feel what tournament golf is all about. So my final question to him was two days ago, you talked about trying to learn that tournament golf feel again. That being said, what have you learned through the first two days here at PGA national? I think it shows to tiger or anyone else, you actually listen to what they say. You're not putting words into their mouth. And if you do it respectfully, you're going to elicit a good answer. So little tricks of the trade that some people have taught me, you just sort of learn because it's easy to sit on the couch and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe they asked that. Or why didn't they follow up with that? The one question we never ask though, Ben, how do you feel? We will get lambasted back at 
headquarters in Orlando. Okay. One of the worst questions you can ask, how do you feel? I don't know where the book is written on that, but we've heard it enough. Don't ask that. So you think of other ways. What were the emotions like? What's your immediate ah. reaction? You're because like a, you're the like a walking thing. thesaurus, they're, they're, aren't you? <laughs> well, if, if you mess it up as, long, as many times as I had, you're eventually going to learn something. <laughs> nice. But it's the same question, but just asked in two or three different ways. So you mentioned Tiger, and is that – is that the guy that you just really need to be on your toes when when you're interviewing? I, I can't imagine that every single player has you in a tense moment, but is that is Tiger the guy? He is for me, um, simply for the fact he hasn't played a ton of golf over the last four, five, six, seven years. So when you do get the chance to play, and as he did at Honda and Valspar and Bay Hill play well, you're more apt to get a friendlier tiger. And we have seen that in this latest comeback. Yeah. You, I feel like the guard is down just a little bit. Talks about the kids. He's a family man. He's a father now. I mean, he is at a different place in his life. And I would never speak on behalf of tiger, but these are the inclinations I'm getting being around him. There are smiles on his face. There's a two minute stop on the putting green or the range talking to players. I never saw a whole bunch of that. So when I interviewed him at uh, Honda, yes, I'd got my game face on and I'm ready to go. And I have a path of where I'm going to go. Um, but whether it's Tiger or anyone else, I always feel like you got to be on, you got to be sharp. But I think Tiger is Tiger. We, we all put him in such high esteem and rightfully so. We have seen what the ratings have been since he's come back. Um, uh, you want to do it right. And I think simply because of just how great he is and that I haven't interviewed him a whole bunch, just again, because he hasn't played yeah. a ton of golf. Yeah. Uh, there's that little butterfly in, in my stomach. I won't be afraid to admit it, but as my wife, Kate told me, be ready and look him in the eye and go because he'll smell fear. He'll smell intimidation. So that, you know, <laughs> Oh yeah. Well. Do it the right, but, but she's right. Treat him like a guy. Treat him like anyone else, and he he knows who we are. You know, sometimes he might not acknowledge it. So I think the more you just do it the right way and respectfully, um, you know, it's a different tiger we're seeing. But but certainly when I have the opportunity to interview him, um, I take full advantage. Yeah, the intimidation factor of Tiger is always going to be there on the golf course. But you're right; it does seem like there is a kinder, gentler Tiger around now. Uh, did did that throw you off, or does that throw you off a little bit in yeah, your yeah. interview process with him? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's different. And he's been the first to admit this whole stretch in 2018 of, I'm just happy to be playing golf. I'm pain-free. We go back six, eight months ago, Ben. He finally w waved his hand and sort of had that white flag creeping up a little, yeah. saying, I don't know if this is going to happen again. So I think there's a true... Wow, I'm really lucky to be, you know, to be back. I'm feeling good. I'm getting better. Um, I just think at 42 years of age and considering the physical issues he has had to deal with, I think he is just happy and genuinely pleased to be back out there. Don't get me wrong. Still a competitor, still wants to win. I just think we're seeing a different side of him. So it's I think it's refreshing considering all that he's been through to see that. And it just clicked with me. The best interview, in my opinion, I ever did with him was Monday of Ryder Cup at Hazeltine. That was less than 24 hours after Arnold Palmer passed away. Yeah. And we were on the air for 30 some odd straight hours. And it was all about Arnold Palmer and rightfully so. And I was interviewing every player in Hazeltine about Arnold Palmer. And we had it set up at the team hotel at 5.30 that I was going to interview Tiger Woods. And I got there at 4.15, and I waited, and I had my questions up and down, back, backward and full. I mean, I was ready to go. And I wasn't sure what you're going to get. And 10 seconds in, I knew, just stay out of his way. He's absolutely engaged, and it was some of the best 10 minutes 
from Tiger Woods I've ever been a part of. And I was fortunate to have many people say that. That was great. He opened up. And I think it was easy because it was not about him. Yep. It was about Arnold Palmer. Yep. It was about somebody else. It wasn't about how's your health? When are you coming back? What's going on? When are we going to see you? It was about somebody that meant the world to him. And I remember wrapping up that interview of what are you going to miss the most? And he said his friendship. And I said, why? He said, because he was always there for me when I needed him. Yeah. Said a lot. And you never heard or seldom heard Tiger ever open up about that on really any topic. So to me, for me personally, that was the turning point of seeing a different side of Tiger Woods with a microphone in front of him. And let me ask you this too, you know, back in maybe the seventies and eighties, um, you know, the, these experiences with journalists and, and athletes where they can go grab a beer or, or socialize and nothing would be reported about that. Now we're in such a, you know, TMZ, you meant, you mentioned just kind of getting close to tiger there and having a real open and honest conversation. He was kind of bearing his soul a little bit about his thoughts with Palmer or thoughts on Palmer. Um, are those days kind of gone? Have you been able to get in with any of the guys on the PGA tour or uh, the ladies on the LPGA or web.com or champions? Do they even let the guard down a little bit or is it just such a protected um, it, are things just so protected that you really can't? Yes and no. Uh, things have changed in there probably is a little more of a shield or guard up in this 2018 social media frenzy, snap pictures, et cetera, et cetera. I've been very fortunate through the college avenue to create relationships. I've been lucky enough to know Jordan Spieth since he's 14, Justin Thomas, similar age. Uh, the list goes on and on of these teenagers a decade ago from that vaunted class of high school uh, graduates of 2011 with Ali Schneider Jans and Patrick Rogers and Daniel Berger. So unbeknownst to me, when I started this whole college angle to further my career and help the golf channel in their uh, coverage of it, most of these guys remember me or know me like, Hey, you were there when no one else was. So if it is Jordan or Justin and I need something, I'll shoot a text. I'll get a call. Maybe in the earlier days, we'd grab a bite here and there. Their worlds have certainly changed. Sure. And that's where I'm very careful. There's a line. I, I, I might be buddies. I might be friends, but for the most part, I'm a reporter. I'm a journalist. And I never want to cross that line of that becoming more important than my job. And I think I've done a pretty good job of, you know, understanding, hey, I need a favor work-wise. Can you help me out? Or, hey, I got a question for you personally. Can you share something with me on or off the record? So, yeah, I think the days of, you know, Bob Drum and Arnold Palmer, you know, amongst others sitting back and right. having steak and beer doesn't happen as much. But the right scenario, the right situation, uh, I won't say I haven't ended up having dinner with some of the – best players in the world from time to time. And do you feel that your strongest responsibility is to your employer, the golf channel where, um, you know, you need to do what's, what's best for them, or is it to maybe you owe more to the viewers and getting the, the coverage and the questions. Do you owe more to the PGA tour players to protect the relationship? I mean, I guess we're kind of talking about the same thing where there's that fine line where you need to deliver impact to the golf channel, but not, I didn't word that well at all. <laughs> no, but I, I know what you're getting at. It, it's a combination of things. You know, first and foremost, I'm towing the company line. I'm lucky to work for the Golf Channel. They treat me well. They give me great assignments that, you know, it's a win-win for both of us. So ultimately, I'm going to be loyal to them through and through. But I know where you're getting at from the standpoint of when I've got to go deep or I've got to get some hard hitting answers, questions. Again, I think when you do it respectfully, you do owe it to the fans and viewers to there'll be a situation where you just have to ask good or bad. What in the hell happened there? Or what am I missing? Or right. what was going through your mind? They know it. And I think even though they might not love you at that moment, the player hopefully walks away respecting you knowing yeah, that, that had to be asked. 
Right. Some people react and respond to it better. Others, yeah, you know, maybe not so much. So it's it's the combination of doing what's right for us as a network, fulfilling the needs, desires, and wants of viewers and our fans and the audience to try to provide that inside the ropes experience. That's basically what I try to do as a host, as a reporter, as someone doing interviews, I'm the boots on the ground. What can I do to, to share a nugget, a piece of information that they're going to say, wow, I didn't know that, you know, and, and it circles back to protecting the players. Something I'll, I'll throw in a quick aside and you'll see it with our Olympics coverage, you know, as Comcast owns NBC and golf channel and I learned it from Tommy Roy, great golf producer, longtime NBC golf producer, when I was fortunate to do the U.S. Amateur for a decade with those guys, sitting next to Dan Hicks and Gary Koch in the booth. And my first year, they didn't know what to do with me. They didn't know me. I didn't know them. We figured it out at Hazel Team. Sure. And the following year, 07, we're at Olympic Club, and Tommy's going through everyone's assignments and then comes to me and Steve, we had you on the course last year. That went pretty well. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Well, we're not going to do that this year. You're up in the booth. I said, okay, let's go. And he taught me from an early age, tell me something I don't know. Give me a reason to care. And I didn't quite know what that meant. It seems easy. You're in a new position. You're on the big network. And I'll always remember it. Colt Nose playing Michael Thompson in the finals. Colt Nose ends up winning. And Michael Thompson had started collegiately at Tulane. And after Hurricane Katrina was without a golf program, as the golf teams, among other issues, major and more severe, were disbanded at Tulane. And J.C. Well, the head coach at Alabama, when I had spoke to him, that night prior or earlier that morning to get a little more intel, go a little deeper, told me Michael Thompson is the only kid at that point he had offered a scholarship to sight unseen, had never seen him hit a golf ball, but took the words of others who spoke highly and said it would be a great fit. And there was this 10 or 15 second dead space. And I'm still hesitant. I'm still trying to find my niche on that broadcast team. And I went with it, thinking, is it meaningless? Is it trivial? And I do it. I time it out right, and Tommy's in my ear. That's why you're in there. Nobody knows that but you. That is why you are in there. Right. And the light bulb went off for me. I said, it's those little pieces of information, those little storytelling ideas you can share that nobody's likely going to hear about on a, on a local broadcast or read on the Internet or in a newspaper tell me something I don't know and give me a reason to care. And that 15 seconds, 12 years ago has changed everything I've done since. So when you're, let me just actually just fast forward to just your current status. When you're at a college event or you're at a web.com event, when you're getting these stories and these nuggets, what's your procedure for storing all this data? I mean, you can't just, (laughs) yeah, well, (laughs) I mean, I, 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 have you talked to my wife, Kate, before we started taping this? Because I've got endless amounts of index cards, notepads, scratch paper with everything under the sun on it. And my putting it all together in a digital format in 2018, shall we say, is lacking. And I've actually made a very concerted effort to take all that information and consolidate it in a much more accessible form. So I've probably hurt myself a lot through the years because sadly I can remember most everything I've ever come across, but if you want to double check or maybe there's a specific day or date, uh, I could show you a backpack about six feet away from me here on the hotel bed that if I emptied it out, we'd find five or six great stories or nuggets and I'll say, Oh, I'll be darned. I I thought I lost that card a few years back. So my gosh, I I need to do better. There have been plenty that have said, you've got to write a book. You've got so many stories and so many things that people don't know about. Um, But normally if in the right scenario, I get on the phone and I'll spend time with somebody 
Or if I go to the U.S. Amateur, I'll pull a card under the tree and say, give me five minutes. Let's talk. And luckily, doing that over the years, forming wonderful relationships and doing it the right way has allowed me to pull that card up uh, under any tree at virtually any reasonable time to get what I want. All right. So the first thing we got to do is get you like a, an account with, do you know what, okay. Do you know what Evernote is? Have you ever heard of Evernote? Again, you must have Kate, my wife on speed dial. No, no, no. Let's not make it, let's not make Steve, let's not make it weird. I don't have your wife's phone number. Let's come on. Strictly for business purposes. Come on now. Come on. (laughs) Hey, let's put it this way, Ben. I have gotten emails saying, thanks for signing up for Evernote, this, that, and the other. And God is my witness, I can assure you, I haven't signed up for Evernote. So that's my wife giving okay. me the inclination and the password saying, I've done it all. Just start putting in yeah. the information. Yeah, that's. Uh, I actually use that for uh, for the podcast. But before we get into note-taking uh, stories, I, let's let's actually just pivot right back into, uh, into golf. So you have this amazing job. You talk to the best players in the world. You talk to the best amateurs in the world. Um but no job is perfect. And I just, you know, no matter how great your job is, it's just nothing can be perfect all the time. What are some of the aspects of your job? And I'm not asking you to throw your boss or anyone else under the bus, but what are some of the things about your job that are the most frustrating? The most frustrating. Wow. Um, that's a great question. Um, it was probably frustrating how long it took to get on air, to get where I wanted to be. I know you've got to put in your dues, you roll up your sleeves, you need luck, timing, etc. Frustrating, but rewarding at the same sense, because when it does happen, you sort of take that moment and say, I'll be damned, that, that's been worth it. That's been a heck of a ride. Um, I'm lucky. You know, I've got first world problems. I don't have problems. That being said, married, two young boys, two and four years old, on the road 30 weeks a year. That's tough. Yeah, that's tough. I'm not asking anyone to feel sorry for me because I know there's 10,000 people that would walk to the next place I need to be and do it for free. That gets tough. As you get older, you start a family. Luckily I married an amazing woman who's ultra successful, ultra competitive and understands what I'm doing and chasing the dream, living the dream, however you want to phrase it. Uh, but that get, that gets to be a challenge because you miss things. You miss trick or treating on Halloween. You might miss a birthday. You might miss the first day of nursery school. That's tough. Yeah. That's really really tough. That being said, again, I don't have real problems. You can find anyone that's making twenty million dollars a year somewhere, and they'll give you some things that are, you know, tough to deal with. Sure. But in the big scheme of things, uh, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. But that's probably the the biggest challenge for me right now, trying to be a great father, a great husband, and also great at what I do professionally. And as far as, you know, those are the, the challenges with the job, but what are what about the, the best parts of your job? What's your favorite time at a golf tournament? What's your favorite – what are the things that still excite you? Boy, there's nothing like a, a Sunday at a major or something big, a Ryder Cup. I mean, Hazel team two years ago, I've never quite seen anything like it. 50, 60, 70,000 people watching four matches on three different holes. You know, it's that gets the juices flowing. And that's where if there are ever doubts, which there aren't, but, you you know, you sometimes say, all right. And it just gets you going like you're a, a 16 year old watching on your couch. And then I sit here and I realize. I'm eight feet away or I'm just right behind that green where so-and-so, you know, Ryan Moore, when, when he clinched the Ryder cup, I mean, I, I could have gotten to the hole quicker than his ball did from 20 feet away. And you sit there and you say, I'll be damned. I'm lucky. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. You know, to be right there in the mix or to interview Phil Mickelson Sunday at Marion back five years ago where we finally thought that was going to be his breakthrough in a U.S. Open. Yep. To immediately get him, have to be respectful, but also have to be direct with the questioning. That's a great spot to, to be that voice. And goes back to your earlier question, that's where I owe it to the viewers. 
to the fans to elicit some type of emotional, genuine disappointment from Phil on that Sunday just outside of Philadelphia. So to be in the mix when something special is happening, there's nothing like it. On the flip side, a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday at a PGA Tour event. Uh, Pebble Beach earlier this year, I hadn't seen Rory in a long time. He had taken four or five months off because of injury. Gets back going in the Middle East. So I hadn't probably seen him, you know, since uh, late fall. So five, six months. We have a good relationship, and I pick him up somewhere on the back nine, and we walk a hole or two. It's a practice round. He'd never been there. He's playing with his father, sort of a bucket list thing. And there's no mic in hand, and my pen and paper in the back pocket. We have a conversation about life, his married life, how things are going, how's his wife doing. And we just sort of weave in and out of what's going on. And we get into golf and health. And we have 20 minutes that there are few other sports where you can do that. You can't walk out to a training session with the Patriots in July or, you know, days before a game and say, hey, Tom, I'm going to – I'm yeah. going to go up and down the field with you for a couple of series and tell me how Giselle's doing. That doesn't exist. So to have that relationship, the respect, uh, and the access to be able to do something that, that few others are doing, that's also a really neat part of what I get to do. You mentioned something about the Ryder Cup, and this brings up a question I wanted to ask you. You, you see these guys at regular tour events. You see them on Monday, Tuesday, like you said. And then you see him up close in a Ryder Cup. How easy is it for you to notice their, the difference in their facial expressions and their body language between a reg- regular PGA Tour event and a Ryder Cup? Can you think of one example where, wow, this guy is really feeling it. He's, he's a mess right now. I don't know if there's a specific example, okay. uh, but there's certainly – a noticeable difference. And you'll get most players candidly saying that you're not just playing for yourself. You're playing for your teammates. You're playing for your country. Um, you know, I was at Glen Eagles in 2014 and, you know, I'm trying to think of, you know, that body language. T- I feel like they all walk the walk. I'm right. sure inside some of them, are probably happy they didn't have a big breakfast that morning because it might right. not stay down. Um, you know, I was on that first tee at Glen Eagles. I was the first tee at Hazel team a couple of years ago. I mean, there are thousands of people there hours before the opening tee shot. And then, you know, they'll see the, the first American team come up. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with who is the home team that year. Because if it's the Americans – on U.S. soil, their chins are up, their heads are high. And the same, you know, for the Europeans, and not saying that they would come dejected, but I think they know what they're up against, depending who's got 50,000 rooting for them and who has 500 rooting for them. So, you know, they, they, they've all been there. They're in big spots before, but I can assure you a handful on or off the record will tell you, man, I, you know, and you'll hear it. I, I didn't think I was going to hit the ball or I blacked out and I don't even remember making contact. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious so, if you noticed something in there, it just, cause I know they put the, they put the armor up at every single event, you know, they exude confidence at all times. I'm just thinking at that moment, I know they tow the line of it's my, you know, playing for the other guys and playing for my country, but have you visibly seen, man, that guy just doesn't look like he normally does. Yeah, probably fortunately on either side, I, I haven't. But, okay. uh, I again, I can assure you that the nerves are going uh, when they're there. Sure, sure. So I do have to ask, since you're balancing so many different things at the Golf Channel, whether it's web.com, whether it's college or anchoring Golf Central, uh, there's always an earpiece in your ear with someone on the other end of it uh, telling you, you know, how much time you have left and, and where we're going, what we're doing. Can you give me just at least a story about when you and the producer just were not on the same page and just everything just fell to shit? You know, luckily I haven't completely tripped all over myself uh, where it's been a disaster. And that's because I've got great people in my ears. But I do remember 
gosh, it must have been the Deutsche Bank a few years ago, and I'm getting Rory. And, hey, you've got two questions. Go A and B. Go here and there. And we start going here, and he's going long. But it's a good answer, and he's going from here to there. So he's answering both things I've wanted and needed in one question. And then there's some can't-miss action on the course. Well, don't ask that second thing. He's already asked it. Well, get back out to 12. I'll wrap it up. Get the mic away from him. I'll just go to 16. So there's chaos and somehow, some way, it might have felt like a mess to me. Luckily, no one at home said, what in the world was that? Right. So there, there, I have a lot of voices in my head to begin with without an IFP in. Nice. But luck, luckily, I'm able to separate that. But I don't think I've ever had a complete disaster where I'm looking around or looking down or fumbling. Uh, so let's hope the next time we do this years from now that I can say the same thing, but it does change on the fly, but ultimately great people in my ears will keep the traffic flowing. Sometimes it just might be LA or New York rush hour traffic with horns going and people weaving in and out. And you just hope not to get hit. Yeah. All right, so we're getting ready for the national championship. You're, the men are going to be at uh, Stillwater. Oklahoma State is hosting it this year. One of the things I want to ask you is your preparation for not just this event, but your preparation year-long, cultivating your knowledge of the college game. When you're not on TV, when you're not at a tour event, what are some of the things you're doing to increase your knowledge base on college golf? It never ends, as you alluded to, and at this time of the season with conference championships wrapping up and the regional selections coming out as they all gear up the men and women to get to Carson Creek and Stillwater, I'm always looking at scores. I'm always looking at the school's websites. I've done it for so long, I sort of know how to just weave in and out, keep an eye on the big targets, also don't lose focus of a great story maybe flying under the radar, but you know, the college golf season, a lot of people maybe don't realize is a a year long thing collegiately. They'll start in early September, basically go through mid November, come back late January, early February, and go through the end of May. There's a lot of logistics on days of competition and practice that uh, I won't bore you with, but from basically the time they start, a school year in the fall until they wrap it up in the spring, they're going other than that downtime around the holidays. So for eight or nine months a year, I'm always looking, I'm always keeping an eye on it, maybe sending a coach a text or congratulating a player on a win or making a phone call and saying, let's chat for a few minutes. I've been noticing something or seeing something. I need a little more in-depth background confirming or sharing otherwise what's been, what's been happening with a certain player or team. Um, that never ends. And then it sort of continues through the summer, Ben, because these kids, the men and women, you're playing in the U.S. Amateurs. You're playing in all these prestigious events. You've got a Curtis Cup. You've got a Walker Cup. It is almost like a full-time job, even though they're amateurs. So through the course of major championships and PGA Tour events and Web.com Tour events, I'm always looking might be 20 minutes in the hotel and might be on a plane flying from a to B, but especially at this time of year, I pride myself. on trying to know a little bit about everybody because you know what? Everybody has a chance to win it all. And I think that's my respect to the fans and the viewers to educate them, to inform them, to fill them in on information that maybe I've gathered over months, but that maybe have a two hour show to learn about it and see if I can't weave it in. So it never ends, but I absolutely love it. And regardless of what the next 20 years hold for me professionally, I'll always remember college golf is my passion and allowed and opened these doors to do what I'm doing today. So I feel like I owe it to them because they have no idea what allowing me to do has truly allowed me to do professionally. Where do you see college golf going for even the, just the next five to 10 years? I mean, just last night we had a prime time on the golf channel selection show for the regionals, for the ladies. 
those things weren't happening five, ten years ago. We, you, were, you didn't really hear anything about how the how the regionals were set up and and how the national championship worked. Now they're going via satellite. You know, they have the the ladies of uh, Oklahoma State that are going to host their their regionals. So where do you where do you see things going for the next five to ten years? Where do you want to see them go? I hope it just keeps going the path we're on. You look back to 2014 for the men and 2015 for the women, the commitment the NCAA and Golf Channel has made to broadcast their championships. And that's just two weeks in a year. We try to pride ourselves on creating the East Lake Cup, an event we have in uh, late October, early November, that invites the four teams from the previous year's NCAA championships to have a facsimile of an NCAA championship, a stroke and a match play portion. You mentioned the regional shows, the men's coming up a week from now. It's we're, we're letting people know this is where most of the men and a good part of the women that you will see professionally for the next couple of decades are coming from. I mean, I remember a stat, I think I'm going to go back four or five years ago, 24 of the 30 in the final FedEx cup standing. So 80% of the players that made it to East Lake played college golf. Do people really realize that Adam Scott played at UNLV for a year and a half that Paul Casey went to Arizona state? You know, I don't know if even the passionate fan realizes some of those things. This is the pipeline for the next generation out here on the web.com tour. You look at the guy, Justin Thomas was out here three, four years ago. He's the PGA tour player of the year. Yeah. You know, this is where it's coming. So it is the natural progression backwards to say, okay, before they get to the web and the PGA tour, where are they coming from? They're coming from college golf. You know, we've got a commitment a 10-year extension between Golf Channel and NCAA, we're going to be broadcasting their championships till you know, 2028, 2030. So at least for the next 10, 12 years, we will continue to showcase the young talent, broadcast the championships, show our in-depth knowledge, reports, features, stories on our digital platforms, on Morning Drive, on Golf Central, you know, with the highlight and the showcase at the NCAA. So I see it going nowhere, but straight ahead. Wouldn't maybe call it a freight train, but just get on board because sure. it's going to keep moving forward. And you'd like to think a generation from now, 10, 15 years that we will have created that natural connect the dots from A to Z from somebody that won a conference championship to someone that's a major champion. Look at Patrick Reed just won the masters. Seven and eight years ago, he helped Augusta State at the time win back-to-back national championships. This is where they're coming from. Yeah. You mentioned creating the Eastlake Cup. Has, has there been any discussion on creating some sort of a kind of a, a showcase tournament where you match up a professional and an amateur from the same school and compete in maybe like a two-man team event, like maybe like Spieth and Scheffler from Texas, uh, you know, St- even Steve Stricker, Dylan Meyer, Illinois, um, I mean, it would have been good like Kucher and, and Schneider Jans from Georgia Tech. Is that something that Golf Channel can – have they have there been discussions of something like that? You know, not privy to the in-depth discussions and not sure, but that idea has been floated about. And I think the biggest obstacle that always seems to come in the way uh, – Don't say it. it. Don't say it. it is el- el- eligibility uh, in NCAA and amateurism. Well, we won't give them uh, shoes. We won't give the kids shoes. We won't do that. Though. You know, but that idea has been talked about, you know, how far it's actually gotten to completion of, because you know what? Everybody has a vested interest. Every what most people have gone to a college. They support their university. Their kids go somewhere. They support that school and their programs. It's a natural fit to have that 42 year old or that 25 year old feed on with perhaps the next one. Um, but that darn amateur thing, that always becomes a bit of a problem. <laughs> uh, I, I kind of, I knew as I was asking the question, I knew what the answer was going to be, but you know, you, I, I just think that'd be just an amazing event. 
And I, I would hey, just... let's never give up on it. There's always okay. a way. Okay. Well, all right. So you just said it's going to happen. Perfect. Um... <laughs> <laughs> so you're telling me there's a chance. So you're telling me there's a chance. So just to give our listeners an idea of the craziness of your schedule and what it's going to be like for the next two months, right now you're in Evansville, Indiana. Uh, tell me a little bit about that stop and what you have coming up. Uh, mostly on the road. Yeah, I'm in Evansville this week for the Web.com tour event at Victoria National Golf Course in Newburgh, Indiana. Maybe the best, certainly the most challenging they see all year long. It's ranked 43rd in America. Uh, in the most recent Golf Digest rankings, this place is legit. So I'll go from the Web.com tour this week. I'll be home actually next week. Surprise, surprise. We'll have the regional show next Wednesday. So I'll be in studios in Orlando for that. Then the following week up at Ponte Vedra for the players are live from uh, that we're on from sunup to sundown. Dig, you know, dig your feet in, get ready to roll. <laughs> nice. Then home for a couple of days. We'll have a recap of the regional shows uh, for the men middle of that week. Then I'll go to Stillwater, Oklahoma for about 15 days for the women's and men's NCAA championships. We'll have the final three days of competition for both the men and the women. We'll have our pre games, our post games. We, it's like a live from experience. I mean, it's a, I'm going to ballpark about 100 hours of coverage between both weeks. It's a lot of fun. Then I come home for a few days, then back up to Chicago for a web.com event. Then I go from there to Shinnecock Hills for the U.S. Open. So, yes, in the next six weeks, maybe I'm home eight to ten days. But the good thing after that, we're taking the family on a nice vacation. It'll be Kate's birthday, the boys' first plane trip. So, There are little bonuses to getting a couple of weeks off periodically here and there to have some balance, to have a good life uh, experience and spend time with the family. Uh, But you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. Sure. Well, and you just got to be killing it with frequent flyer miles. So, I mean, that's just the unspoken thing we don't want to talk about, but you just got to be killing it with that. I'm doing okay on Delta. Okay, there you go. (laughs) Hey, Delta's a sponsor now. Great. Um, so <laughs> b- before I let you go, I just got, I'm going to ask you some quick questions that are uh, a segment called uh, the quick bucket here at the back of the range. I ask these to all the guests. You know, this one might be a little diff- difficult for you because these are people that you see and work with on a continual basis, but we'll uh, we'll throw them out there anyway. Uh, Jack Nicholas, his 1986 victory in the Masters. He was 46 years old. Compare that to a potential fifth green jacket for Tiger Woods. In your mind, what would be the most substantial victory of the two? Personally, Jack Nicklaus, 1986, will be the standard for me. And I say that the obvious reasons, the six green jackets, what he did on the second nine. But my introduction to golf was in 1980 at the U.S. Open at Baltusrol. Grew up about five minutes from there. My dad took my brother and I out there. Don't remember a lot. I was seven or eight. Um, But I remember at the end on the scoreboard, they put up, and everyone remembers that shot, Jack is back. back. And I asked my dad, where has he been? Wow. Yeah, I I was too young to, what do you mean, where has he been all this time? And my dad sort of laughed because, no, here's the greatest of all time, and he's had a couple of lean years but he's back. I said, Oh, okay. I just, I didn't know where he was. Sure. So Jack is, you know, Jack is back. That's a seven year old kid in New Jersey, not realizing that the greatest had just won another major championship. So personally from that day on, I was a Jack Nicholas guy. I'm a realist tiger winning a fifth would trump everything in 2018 because he doesn't move the needle. He is the needle. Look at when the Golf Channel started, 1995. 18 months later, we got the famous Hello World. Yep. I'm not going to say we wouldn't have all the success we've had for 23-plus years. Tiger Woods showing up shortly after the Golf Channel starting, I think, is a marriage made in heaven that has allowed this channel to become – Pretty damn big and pretty impressive. So oh, I've always yeah. looked at Tiger in the regard of, you know what? You've made everybody rich on the PGA Tour. The purses have gone up 500%. He's also made the Golf Channel what it is. And, and a lot of people have. 
but I think the timing couldn't have been better. Yeah. Well, I think it's him. I mean, it's, it's Palmer starting it and it's tiger growing it. So you're absolutely right. Yep. Without, yeah, well without, said. Yeah. Without those two. Um, all right. This is going to be a difficult one. You have a chance to give a major championship to anyone in history, alive, dead, could be Mr. Nicholas, or it could be someone with no majors. Who would you most like to give a major to and potentially interview at the at the award ceremony? Well, that's a good one, because I've listened to all of your podcasts, so I know these questions have been coming. You're, and the, I've one heard everybody's you're answers. the one that's been listening to all the episodes. I'm glad we got I've, to the I, I just that. started the most recent one on my afternoon run today, so I'm in a good spot. Um, I'm giving it to Jack. And I'll tell you why. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Th- wait a minute. You're the only one that's ever said that, it, which you all know. Y- you want to give yeah. Jack another major. But the way you, and I was going to say this regardless, but the way you teed it up, 18 major championships. Let's go back 20 years ago, 1998. I'm at the Masters covering it for my third time. Okay. The radio station in Columbia, South Carolina, I was working, had a pass to go there. The sports director and assistant sports director had no interest. So I'm a 24, 25-year-old running around, seeing Norman's collapse, seeing Tiger win by a dozen, and O'Meara wins in 98. Right. That Saturday, Jack Nicklaus makes about a 30-footer, 40-footer on 18 for par. And I don't know how you can pull it up. But every year I go into our library and I pull the final day coverage of CBS's Masters in 1998. And normally you'll have this grandiose Jim Nance, dulcet tones, this eloquent tea setting it all up. And right at three o'clock, it was a cold open. Welcome to the Masters. You're not going to believe what you're about to see. And it's Nicholas Burdine too, and chipping in for birdie on three. And birdieing six. This is sort of pre-internet 20 years ago. Yeah. This isn't let's go follow live scoring. There was no tease. There was no grandiose entrance. It was this is 58-year-old Jack Nicholas. He gets to the second nine. Then he's two back. He's 58 years old. I was there. Ernie Ells played with him. Never heard it directly from Ernie, but on multiple occasions people telling me after a few holes Ernie you know off to a poor start but he sat in awe watching this guy 30 years older than him try to win his seventh green jacket people don't won't remember it very few tied for six that year if he makes anything coming in those final few holes he was that close to winning green jacket number seven so to see that in person for you to tell me I could interview the winner, I don't care if he has 18. Remember, he has 19 runner-up runner finishes oh, in major yeah. championships. That. Yeah. He's that close away from winning 25 or 30 of these things. So, yes, he's won more than anyone else. Maybe that number never gets touched. I'm going to make sure he has another one and give him the 98 green jacket. Seven days in a week, seven green jackets. He has one from Sunday to Saturday. You know, that's a hell of an answer. You really should think about getting into the golf uh, uh, broadcast business with that. Yeah, nonsense. I might want to reevaluate my day job. <laughs> yeah, you might want to get that. Well, damn it. That's a really good answer. All right. I'm going to, that's, that's excellent. You know, you, you kind of had me into a jacket for every single day. And then, yeah, you get to interview him too. God, that's a good answer. Does Tiger, I got to ask you the, the Tiger question. Does he win another major? I've been asked a lot. Over the past few months and a few years, but but here's, I'm not ducking the question, as the time has continued until, we'll say, the Florida swing, I've always said you never say never with Tiger Woods. He did things that Jack didn't do, that no one's going to do. I don't believe we'll see anybody ever do what he did, winning the Masters by 12, winning by 15 at Pebble. I don't think that ever happens again, not in our generation. You never say never with Tiger. I've thought there have been more questions than answers. Being at Honda, being at Valspar, being at Bay Hill, I think some of those questions have been answered. So I'm not ducking it. 
I just think there were a lot more question marks, and I think we have seen glimpses of, okay, maybe some of those questions are answered. The pain appears to be gone. His ball striking seems to be coming back. His short game that was tragic a couple of years ago is spot on. So it's coming together. You never say never. You never say never. Um, boy, would it be fun to watch. Oh, yeah. Gosh, let, let, let me be the one sitting down with him that night because uh, that would be memorable. Yeah. Now I'm trying to think if I, I, I haven't really formulated my opinion on that either. Um, gosh, I, I can't even believe that this year at Shinnecock is the last year of his exemption for the U S open. 10 years since he won a major. Yeah. I was there at Tory in 08. We're what now 13 years removed from a master's win. I mean, go back to Tory. He had 14 major championships and he was 32. Yep. You could have told me he was going to win 25 and we'd all say that's a 50, 50 bet. Life's tough. Father time, uh, you know, is undefeated. The body is, has, has been an issue for Tiger. He's dealt with some other things, but, uh, man, he's fun to watch and, and, and to see him in the mix again. I mean, Bay Hill, he goes to 16 tees, one back, three holes to go. So it's getting closer. Valspar, he birdies the last, he forces a playoff. It's, I don't want to say it's coming, but, boy, it sure looks like it is. Well, Steve, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, this has been uh, uh, clearly you were, you're carrying this episode, and I greatly appreciate that. Uh, best of luck for the rest of the uh, the year. You got a lot of travel, so travel safely and enjoy the NCAA championships. And hopefully we'll be able to do this again sometime soon. Absolutely, Ben. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. You're off to a great start. And, uh, yeah, let's make this a yearly thing. That sounds great. And there you have it, another great episode here at the Back of the Range. Special thanks to Steve Burkowski from the Golf Channel for all of his time. We are hitting the road tomorrow, off to Cabot Links in Inverness, Nova Scotia. So make sure you follow us on Instagram, the Back of the Range podcast. That's where all the photos, all the videos are going to be posted. We have our first on-site interview with the general manager at Cabot. That's going to be exciting. And if you want something out of the pro shop, let me see what I can do to help you out. But shoot me an email, ben at the back of the range.com, and you never know what might show up at your doorstep. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of your week. Have a great Memorial Day weekend, and I'll see you next week here at the back of the range.